All right, well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap today. I am super excited about this one. I think it's gonna be a great case study. Uh, lots of information to impart, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your question and answer tab on your interface and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Zero Trust Journey, a security leader story. Our speakers today are John Dasher, who is the VP of Product Managing, <laughs> Product Marketing, I should say, at Banyan Security, and Robert Davis, who is the Director of Cybersecurity at Chick-fil-A. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Glad All to right. be here. All right. Well, John, I know you're kicking it off. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, let you get right to it. All right. Okay. Well, this should be a great, great uh, session here today. You know, as we think about security, many of the tried and true concepts, you know, we were taught or learned as we were coming up through the profession are getting, you know, out updated fairly significantly and in some cases outright replaced. Uh, acknowledging that the traditional castle and moat approach to security needs retirement, zero trust especially has been generating a lot of interest. Zero trust, of course, is the idea that trust should not be automatically given to anything inside or outside its perimeters. Uh, we shouldn't trust something just because it's on a specific network, but rather everything and anything trying to access resources must first be verified. Um, the principle of least privilege access and continuous authorization are compelling to be sure, but the implementation of these concepts can seem daunting. And I'm excited about this webinar today because we get to talk to somebody who has uh, walked a mile in those shoes, as it were. Uh, today, we're going to talk to Robert Davis of Chick-fil-A about his journey from seeing Zero Trust as a compelling idea to actually being able to implement it in his organization. So with that, let me welcome Robert. Uh, Robert, uh, welcome. Thank you, John. It's good, good to be here. Really excited about this. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up at Chick-fil-A. Yeah, so uh, going through college, I was a computer science major and uh, fairly quickly realized I didn't want to be a programmer for the rest of my life. And so I, I started trying to look at uh, other options and going through a career fair, I I uh, saw Chick-fil-A and thought to myself, that is strange. I don't know a lot about Chick-fil-A, to be <laughs> honest, but it seems odd that they're here at this engineering career fair. But as I talked to them, you know, it made a ton of sense, right? Everyone has technology to help them in some way. And uh, just I, I got really interested in, in Chick-fil-A as a, as a company, as an organization, made it through that process, and I've been there ever since, which is, uh, it'll be 16 years this summer. So I'm currently uh, the director of cybersecurity uh, for Chick Fil A. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, welcome. So let's talk. Let's let's kind of rewind a little bit and talk about those beginnings where you started to learn about some of the concepts regarding zero trust. Uh, for many of us, uh, the beginning was hearing about Google's Beyond Corp, their concept of leveraging untrusted networks, i.e., the internet. Uh, to allow people to do their jobs. And then, of course, you know, related directly to that, zero trust. Again, this concept of uh, assuming that nobody's to be trusted, regardless of where they are, what network they're on, who they are, and, you know, continuously reestablishing uh, that authorization and that trust and, and principles like, like least privilege access. Where was your first learning about Google's Beyond Corp? Uh, yeah, so I, I ran across a, the the very first uh, Usenix uh, white paper from from Google on on what they were building with Beyond Corp. I think it was late 2016 ish when I when I came across it. Uh, to be honest, I'm not even sure how I came across it, but I it came across my uh, my desk and uh, and I read it and got really really interested in just the concepts of how you can you know increase your security 
um, in this ever changing, more mobile world. Uh, and of course that was a, even a little early back then, but, um, yeah, it, it was fascinating to, for me to, to read that and just, just see that new way of thinking about network security. Um, and just, I kept, kept watching and kept reading. They, they released a few more white papers on some specific design and, and the access proxy and that sort of thing. So I just kind of kept up with it from there. Was this also when you were first exposed to the concept of zero trust? So I, I'd been exposed to it uh, previously, but almost every exposure that I had previously was um, almost solely dedicated to the concept of micro segmentation, where okay. you're you know you're you're separating workloads and and that sort of thing, and and less about the front end and the user experience. Uh, so this was really the first exposure to a more practical use of the zero trust, you know, concepts in the model. Yeah, I mean, for like many things in, in security, especially there's there's things that are super cool, neat ideas. And then sometimes they kind of cross the chasm to wait, I can actually implement that super cool idea. Um, I'm curious, what what from a zero trust perspective, what did you think was, go, you know, early on, what did you think would be the thing that you would first kind of grab onto? Yeah, I think for me, um, the very first thing was just rethinking VPN, right? There was a lot of, if you look at uh, breaches, some of the, the commonalities are, uh, you know, a user workstation gets compromised. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they either, uh, they leverage that network layer that the VPN provides, or if you're on camp, you know, on site. Um, and so you have this entire essentially a trusted network right you're on this thing and now you're you're trusted because of where you were and this was a different way of looking at that and removing that uh you know the the easier possibility of things like lateral movement because you're not trusting the network there is no network layer connectivity in that sense and uh and therefore you get this added level of security so that was that was the first thing that really drew me into uh to the concepts so in your intro, you talked a little bit about how you stumbled onto Chick-fil-A. Um, and of course, you know, for those of you who might not know, Chick-fil-A is a, a worldwide brand famous for their chicken sandwiches, has been super successful. Um, and in fact, you know, has managed to be even more successful uh, over the last year at a time when, when many businesses are struggling. It might not be obvious to folks how a quote unquote restaurant, a quick serve restaurant, um, has software as something that's strategic to its core. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about how software, uh, what role software plays at Chick-fil-A? Yeah, so if you, if you think about Chick-fil-A and um, you know, where, we've, where we were and where we are now 16 years later for, for my career, uh, the growth of, of Chick-fil-A has been you know, just outstanding. It's been a very consistent thing since I've been there. And with growth, uh, at the at the rate of growth that we're seeing, uh, we have to be more efficient in how we do things. And and one of the best ways to be more efficient is to leverage software, right? To help with the process software, yeah. and automating and that sort of thing, right? Uh, in our restaurants, the the volume of customers that we have, uh, generally speaking, on a given day is pretty high, and um, our footprint, uh, restaurant footprint, sometimes isn't isn't quite there to handle that volume. And so that really necessitates a need for these digital platforms, mobile ordering. We, we got into mobile ordering um, a, a fair number of years back now that really set us in a, in a good position coming into um, you know, the pandemic. And, and that really let us maintain that level of efficiency and then in a lot of ways get more efficient because you start shifting the ordering process to mobile, you eliminate a, a, a big bottleneck at the actual restaurants. So software there is it's extremely strategic in helping us achieve higher numbers than we would had we not had it. What percentage of ordering is mobile now? That's a good question. I wish I knew the answer, uh, but it's significantly higher now than it was a year ago. I know that. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so when you uh, were thinking about uh, you know your goals of making progress against you know moving Chick Fil A security toward uh, zero trust principles and architectures. Um, how did you think you'd get started initially? Yeah, initially I really, because the, 
the paradigm and user experience is so different. Uh, I really wanted to start with my team first, so the security team, and say, all right, we, we need to eat our own dog food here, try this new thing out, um, understand all of the potential pain points that might be there for users as we eliminate you know, VPN. Uh, so really understanding, one, what was VPN used for? Right. What what were the applications and systems that people rely on daily that the VPN was there for? And this um, is pre-pandemic. This is pre-pandemic. Yep. So this is this is uh, you know we started this journey um, of of practically looking at zero trust and going down that that road. We started that journey a couple of years ago. Yeah. And so yeah, so it was really to start with my team and and you know remove try to remove VPN see if we can still work the way we need to. Um, yeah, and then just kind of from there, you would move into choosing a, a couple of smaller, less critical apps to test with, to start expanding beyond my team and maybe looking at uh, getting some of the IT department to, to leverage it. Uh, and then eventually looking at business users and getting them involved to get, to get that feedback going before you really uh, implement this holistically across every application. And then for us, the last step will be basically implementing this everywhere and having blocking uh, blocking access to sensitive or critical apps uh, if they don't meet the trust tiers that sure. we're looking for. Yeah, let's co let's come back to that in just a minute. Why don't we uh, Why don't we uh, do a poll question and get a feel for uh, the audience in terms of uh, where they are in their zero trust journey? Yeah, so we do have a polling question that is now open to the audience. The question is, how many folks have started implementing a zero trust project? Uh, we haven't started. We're researching solutions. We've begun implementation uh, or we've deployed and are using a zero trust solution. So the polling question is right there underneath the polling tab. Uh, you should see it uh, there. You can go ahead and make your response. I'm going to leave the poll open for you guys for a few minutes. Uh, John, you can go ahead and continue with your presentation, and we'll uh, we'll circle back and take a look at the poll results later on. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. So let me uh, let me set the stage a little bit here, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we think about zero trust, zero trust remote access. Um, there's really a few things, a few common shared traits that a great zero trust solution has at its core. Um, the first is you have to be able to trust that the users are who they say they are. For most, uh, for most organizations, this means I've got some sort of identity system in place, a single sign-on uh, system in place. The second thing you need, of course, is device trust. You've really got to be able to trust uh, that the device they're using is in fact trustworthy. Uh, whether that's a corporate issued and managed device or an unmanaged device that maybe your contractors are bringing to the party or, you know, BYOD, as Robert mentioned, especially as, you know, the world went mobile, uh, the plethora of the devices is, is certainly out there. And so having some level of confidence that uh, the devices that are connecting to your uh, precious resources are trusted is important. The third thing you want to do is be able to take advantage of the tools that you already have. You know, you've got security tools, you've got infrastructure monitoring tools, um, and they throw off signals that are that are helpful in determining whether we can trust the user and their devices. So to the extent um, there's signals there that we can take advantage of, we, we should absolutely do that. Uh, with regard to distributed enforcement, um, we want to make sure that the enforcement of access policy happens as close to the application or resource as possible. Um, unlike a traditional VPN, which you know acts as a centralized choke point, we want enforcement to be in the logical traffic path because it's best for performance, scalability, efficiency. Um, and then the last building block is this idea of uh, continuous authorization. Um, you know, simplistically, um, you know, bad things happen. And sometimes they even happen, you know, during a connection session. Um, you know, a, a device and a user that were trusted and known good a minute ago could suddenly have an issue. We want to be continuously reevaluating uh, the user and the trustworthiness, the security posture, if you will, of that combo um, in uh, against the backdrop of the sensitivity of the resource they're accessing. Uh, as one of my colleagues likes to say, if someone's trying to access the cafeteria menu 
you know, that's probably low security. And I don't care too much about, you know, who's accessing it and or under what circumstances. But when my back end finances are getting accessed, I care deeply both about who's accessing them and about, you know, how much, how broad is that access. And so things like least privilege access come to play. So anyway, th those five things, you know, put together uh, really yield a lot of benefit in terms of both security and manageability, um, giving your users a consistent experience. And of course, you know, over time, like anything where you're able to automate and improve the administrative capabilities as well as the user experience, you know, you lower risk and you lower your costs. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know, I, Robert, I've been doing security a long time and, you know, you're kind of taught both through experience and, and, and education wise that, you know, security and IT are at odds. You know, IT's charter is to ensure productivity and security's charter, of course, is to ensure the security of our, our data and our intellectual property. And by making something more secure, by definition, it's now less usable. Productivity goes down, security goes up, or I throw open the doors and make it easy for everyone to do their jobs, but I've got to throw security out the window. You know, it's a seesaw. One goes up, one goes down. And, I, and I've been learning that one of the interesting things about zero trust that I just haven't seen often in security is this idea that actually both can go up. I can provide a better user experience for my users um, and I can get better security and better manageability. It's, it's, it's not often uh, we see that, is it? Yeah, no, not at all. I, and um, I agree with you. I think this is one of those one of those times when when it can be, um, you know, a, a heightened level of security. Uh, for the things that matter the most, but still allow for that flexibility and usability, uh, which is it's definitely something that's very attractive about the zero trust model um, in that regard. So, yeah, exactly. I agree with you. So uh, we've got some results back from the poll. Uh, Charlene, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the poll results. Um, the question was, just to refresh everybody's memory, uh, how many folks have started implementing a zero trust project? Uh, the majority, 46%, said that they are researching solutions, uh, followed closely by we haven't started at 36%. Uh, and then uh, we've begun implementation, garnered 10% of the responses, and we've deployed and are using a zero trust solution. 8% uh, of the audience is doing so. So it looks like we've got some people closer to the top of the funnel, if you will, than, uh, sure. than the bottom, mid, mid part or bottom. But uh, great responses all the way around. Thank you uh, to the audience uh, for uh, submitting your responses. Please know we do have another polling question coming up pretty darn soon. So. Uh, Keep your eye out for that, and we'll definitely let you know when it's time. Yeah, we have one more poll question, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. I won't, uh, won't uh, poll question you to death here. Um, <laughs> let, let's keep going here. So, Robert, we talked a little bit about the pandemic, and certainly um, you know, there's no shortage of studies that talk about how in the enterprise we were seeing greater and greater use uh, of remote access, um, of work from anywhere, if you will. Um, you know, certainly mobility, as you mentioned, you know, going back to like, you know, 2005, 2006 and, uh, you know, mobility rapidly taking off, I think, forced a lot of that, the, the, the availability and cost reduction of laptops and all that. But really, when COVID happened a year ago, um, that all of a sudden threw us into a send everybody home. They're working from home. Um, how did the coronavirus pandemic and, and work from anywhere affect your thinking on zero trust adoption? Yeah. So for us, uh, we were um, we invested so heavily in SaaS over the last few years that our VPN usage, generally speaking, was was fairly low as it was uh, percentage wise yeah. across the board. And so when um, when the pandemic did hit and we were everyone was forced to be at home and, and those that traditionally might not have used VPN much then started having to use it, um, that that put a little little wrench in like, and like most companies, we had to uh, beep up our VPN, right? Make sure. some changes, make things work. Um, and then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, it'd be sh sure would be nice if we didn't have to worry about this VPN right now. Um, and, and as we, we had started our uh, implementation the year before, so in 2019, we had started yeah. in a very small pilot, you know, just really making sure we understood the everything about the the concept and the model. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it definitely made me think, okay, um, 
we've gotten through this and there's still a decent amount of VPN usage. Now's the time to to start moving really forward with the implementation. We actually did secure a project this year to do a, a much more broad uh, implementation of it. Let, let me ask you to put your uh, prognosticator hat on just for a moment. You know, the vaccine is now obviously available. We're we're starting through that process. You know, globally, um, have you and your leadership team been talking about you know how you think? remote at you know what percentage of your employees will still be working remotely say at the end of the calendar year i mean have you have you started to play those games or are you kind of taking a wait and see approach yeah there have been a lot of discussions about that you know chick-fil-a um is a company built on relationships right we value in in the restaurant we value relationships with customers same is true at at corporate uh, where we value relationships with each other and and with partners and and customers, and so that that becomes very challenging when it's remote. So we're yeah. still in a lot of discussions about it. Uh, if I had my personal preference, I would be able to work remote for the rest of my life. I, <laughs> I really enjoy that that uh, extra time in the day that I get back, not having to commute. But um, yeah, that's still TBD at the moment uh, on what the the long term plans are there. So would it be your expectation that there'll be some some mix going forward? I would imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. What that yeah, mix okay. looks like is the big question. Yeah, yeah. 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 So let's talk a little bit about about your starting point. You 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 started getting into it and I kind of rudely cut you off there. But, um, you know, what, what we see at Banyan Security is for most organizations, uh, the easiest way for them to get started with Zero Trust is some sort of a, a targeted proof of value project. Um, sometimes it's with a group, like you were mentioning, you started with your own team. Um, sometimes it's with a specific application. Um, you know, sometimes I think people, especially those folks that are researching, think it's like this gigantic all or nothing, boil the ocean. And I've got to rip out, you know, the entirety of my VPN and overnight I got to replace it and pray to God it works, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and that's really not the case. I mean, you can you can really kind of have a granular, constrained uh, project to get started with, and 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 grow you know horizontally, almost like you you scale in the cloud. How did Chick Fil A? You know, you said you told us that you started with your own team, um, but what exactly did you do for your initial deployment? Yeah, so we are we're still in uh, implementation phase, of course, but initially, uh, again, it's basically getting my team. Uh, my original thought was, uh, let, let's get our team using this model uh, for as many applications as we can specifically for this team. Uh, and then we, uh, as we started, as we're starting to do that now and really understand the pain points, um, yeah, it's the, the next step will be, okay, let's get some uh, non-security representation here and get their feedback and pain points and just keep moving down that that path. But to your point, there's no need to, to boil the ocean, right? Provided you choose the right solution, you should be able to choose a solution that allows you to yeah. do one thing at a time, right? Like start with one application. Um, and in best case, you could even start with a non enforcing mode where you're, it's there, and it's usable, but it's not going to stop somebody while you understand the pain points, right? So that's, um, that's what I would recommend is, is just making sure whatever solution you go with allows you that flexibility because that's going to be key to, to successful implementation because it's a, it's a decent change for user experience in mostly a good way, but it's still a change. Um, and people are usually uh, not super excited about change. So. <laughs> So was that one of your bigger challenges or what were, well, I should say, what was your biggest challenge in, in starting your rollout? Yeah, to be uh, completely honest, I think the biggest challenge was not accepting this model and, and knowing the user experience is going to change and there's things in, in that nature. The biggest challenge, quite frankly, is just getting resources dedicated to doing this work, right? Um, Chick-fil-A's uh, growth, again, has been phenomenal, which is wonderful in a lot of ways, but it's hard to keep pace with the growth. And so new projects and new ways of doing things um, become challenging because we're still, you know, we oftentimes have to play catch up in the security world. Um, yep. if, if you want to be innovative as a company, 
security, you know, you have to find the right balance, of course, but um, security is not going to not going to be out in front of everything. Right? So uh, that was that's still our biggest issue today. Um, but we're we're like I said, we're slowly but surely tackling this problem. Right. One thing at a time. And uh, and we'll get there. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll we'll be there uh, with full implementation out there. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, why don't we uh, why don't we do our last polling question and, and let the audience weigh in and see, you know, it, to the extent they've begun thinking about their starting project. Uh, let's see where they are. All right. We've got one going out to you right now. The question is, for those of you who are planning or have deployed a zero trust solution, where did you start? You can choose from developers access to IAAS infrastructure, uh, security slash IT access third-party remote access, or broad VPN replacement. You can go ahead and make your choice. And as with before, I will keep this polling question open. And John and Robert, you guys can continue your conversation. And uh, then before we get to the question and answer period, we'll take a look at the responses. Sounds great. Sounds great. OK, let's uh, let's move on a little bit here. So you, you mentioned earlier, Robert, you know, talking about, you know, thinking through what your solution would be to begin to implement zero trust. Um, what was your evaluation criteria for evaluating vendors and their solutions? Yeah, so for me, uh, as I was researching the zero trust space, I think the most common thing that seemed to come out of any solution that, that was being pitched was um, they were calling zero trust essentially MFA plus, right? So they were they were looking at it and going the identity is is uh, protected by MFA, and we'll add some you know contextual adaptive nature to uh, to their authentication right. But they almost never talked about the device, and that it, it, that always bugged me because uh, you have to have the device in the equation for this to really be zero trust for 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 me right. Um, and so yeah, device level checks having. Having the ability to uh, do some form of check on any device, whether it's managed by corporate or a BYOD or a mobile device, and we need to be able to know something about that device. And if we can't know anything, if we if if we don't know anything about the device, maybe they, they can still access some of the extremely low level, low tiered uh, cafeteria app, for instance. But they will never be able to access uh, a higher level. Uh, tiered trust so well and we've certainly seen in recent uh in recent security and news stories uh you know mfa you know yeah you should you should probably be using mfa but it is by no means a guarantee that uh, uh you are now a hack proof or uh, you're done with security because it can be bypassed and there's been no shortage of recent demonstrations of bypassing mfa so i can see why device level checks would be uh would be an interesting thing to look at uh, yeah. What 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 came next for you? You had mentioned uh, the flexibility of a solution. Yeah, so uh, I was kind of uh, talking about this a little bit with the implementation question, but uh, being it has to be something that's flexible for uh, for our use cases. So it needs to be able to work for on-premise uh, applications. So basically, replacing VPN in a lot of ways. It needs to work in the cloud. Uh, it needs to work with our SaaS solutions. It needs to work with our identity provider. I I, I don't want a new identity provider so it must integrate with that today uh, oh, there you go yeah thir the third criteria sure. um, but yeah being being extremely flexible in how we can implement it starting with one thing and then eventually adding additionals um, or starting in a non-enforcing mode across the board you know just to gather the data those things are, are critically important for success Yeah, and then continuous authorization. I think that that was actually as I was uh, doing some tests and uh, understanding solutions and trying to figure out the best one for us. The continuous authorization was at the bottom of my criteria list, and it still is because if you don't have those first three, then the bottom one doesn't really matter much. Um, but it is when you see it in action. I did some proof of concepts where I, I uh, infected my machine. And then that infection then triggered a, a deny through through the solution, and I was 
I was wowed by it because you don't get that in any traditional network security model. But because of the, the, the way the solution is architected and that ability to check every, in this case, HTTP type request to a web app and check for that authorization, is this, is this identity and device? That was the key, right? And device, not just the identity. Right. They're both still good, so you can access it. But the moment one of those goes um, and in a lower trusted tier, you can block that access. And I, I, that was uh, that was almost like I was running around going, guys, you, you have to check this out. Watch this. Watch this. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I didn't think I would get so excited about that. But um, it's a pretty powerful uh, mechanism. Who'd have thought failure to authorize would be exciting? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. So as, <clears throat> as you look through your list of, of criteria, were those the right? I mean, now that you've had time to kind of, you know, embark on your journey and get, you know, a fair pace down the road, were those the right criteria for you? Yeah, definitely for us. Uh, um, the the only criteria in that first four uh, that again that you know you you might be able to push aside to the next phase of whatever you want to implement uh, is the continuous authorization. It's really really cool, but at the same time, if you don't get those first three right, it really doesn't matter that much. So for me, yes, Dev being able to check the device, know something about it, being very flexible and integrating with existing identity stack and other tools that we have, those, those are still my top three criteria, yeah. One of the things that we will hear from, from prospects and customers that didn't necessarily click earlier in their process, but later you can watch the light bulbs go off is going back to that device level checking and the idea that that one thing spans all of your infrastructure types, all of your device types. And so well, as you were pointing out, you know, whether that app is on-prem or in the cloud or as a SaaS app, it's the same device trust and you can manage it as device trust regardless of the app or where it is or who's using it or from what device. And I think sometimes people just don't understand, don't quite get the value of it. They, they nod their head and they hear the words, but once you start doing it, you're like, oh, I finally have a uniform way of checking device posture and I don't have to be caring about, you know, the specific situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Would you, uh, looking back on it, would you add any criteria? Stuff you wish you would have looked at that maybe you didn't? That's a good question. Um, I would probably get a little more um, in depth with the I, the identity stack. So there's there's one thing to integrate with the, with an identity stack and you know understand OAuth or SAML and do that, but it's another thing entirely to to be able to do that and understand the the stack from top to bottom and know how flexible the rollout can be. Right. There are things that you can do with certain identity stacks that uh, go beyond just creating an OAuth client for every single app and making it a little more um, generic. So I can implement uh, zero trust with really any app I want without having to touch the app itself, because that was really the key. Right. So in in an identity world. With OAuth, you're generally, if you're going to make changes to that in any way, that means you're impacting the app side. So the deployment team has to go make a change to how their OAuth configuration is set up such that you're now in the middle with this new zero trust model. But um, yeah, just understanding that a little bit more, I think, is is probably the only thing. Getting getting closer to your identity stack and understanding all of the, the uh, switches that you can turn on and off to make things easier. In your organization, do you do, are you, do you have as security? Do you have responsibility for identity, or is that on the IT side of the house? Yeah, so we actually security is within IT, so we're we're it, okay. all under the same umbrella. But identity um, is not under the security umbrella. It's still it's under our um, uh, yeah more shared service shared platform yeah. team. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, 
I think it's fairly undeniable that in the last, I don't know what, five years, you know, we've seen IT and security certainly, um, you know, be more collaborative and, and work closer together. Sometimes it's like you said in your organization where it's really, you're all under the IT umbrella. Um, you know, sometimes they're separate organizations, but, you know, clearly there's things that we're talking about here with regard to zero trust that cross the traditional security and IT, you know, uh, borderlines, if you will. And so, mm -hmm. um, that level of, uh, of collaboration uh, can only help uh, a zero trust deployment. And, and, and as you point out, it in fact is required really, especially on the identity side. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, us growing up kind of, um, you know, identity maturing alongside security in the IT world versus uh, us being completely separate and just going to that identity team and saying, hey, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And, the, and they have no idea what we're talking about. We, we've kind of grown up together and it made it, made the, implementation pretty seamless um uh for now so yeah it's been good turning this around <clears throat> if you were a a younger company a, a startup or, or a small small company you really do have to have identity in place before pursuing a, a zero trust solution i mean it, it's kind of one of the, the bedrock core you know we started off talking about the principles of zero trust you know users first thing we talked about. And so you, you really do have to have, you know, your SSO kind of in place yep. and, and, and operating before kind of taking that next step. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to have, you've got to have SSO on a, uh, you know, the using the more modern authentication protocols, OAuth, SAML. Um, and then on top of that MFA, right? If you're not doing MFA first, I feel like there's no, no real reason to go down, uh, another road because MFA is the, is the, uh, puzzle, important, the key. Yeah. yeah. It's that first key. So cool. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, result of the second poll question? And that was around, you know, where people are in their journey. What, uh, what was their pilot project? Charlene, you want to review that with us? Absolutely. So the second polling question is, uh, the, just to re reiterate, uh, for those of you who are planning or have deployed a zero trust solution, where did you start? Uh, the majority of folks, 58% said that they started with security slash IT access. And then uh, about half of those, little less than half, a little, yeah, little less than half said, 21% uh, said developers access to infrastructure as a service. And uh, the remaining two, 12% said 30% third party remote access and only 9% said broad VPN replacement. So those are pretty telling st or, uh, answers there. So uh, it, it, yeah, I wonder it, does security IT access, does that make sense to you as the, the most popular uh, response? We'll let Robert answer that. I mean, yeah, yeah. Path for, you went down. Yeah. yeah, for me, it definitely does. Um, yeah. And it, it really starts with that group um, in some ways may, uh, feel some of the pains more than others. Uh, but Is that also because of the complexity of their typical environment or what, why? Yeah, I think, yes, the complexity. So they're accessing, accessing infrastructure, for instance, right. A, a normal business user might not do that, but they will. And so they'll run into some pain points that business users won't. Um, they'll also in some ways not this very, uh, very general statement, but they may complain more than than some of the business users right especially some of the uh the you know the the power engineers they're they're they'll let you know right away if something is impacting their workflow right um and they don't like that so uh, i think starting there makes the most sense well you probably get a a, a level of technical information with that complaint uh yep. that you might not get from a business user who's simply you know logging into salesforce Exactly. Yep. So I've got, you know, exactly one slide of uh, talking about Banyan security and we'll walk you through and then we'll, we'll take some uh, questions here. Um, we've got a few things that we very consistently hear about why people choose Banyan security. Um, our customers are, are very consistent in this regard. Um, one of the main reasons, one of the first things we hear about is that we support a heterogeneous IT environment. Um, and, you know, we view heterogeneous as a, a big, broad word. It's, it's heterogeneous infrastructure in terms of, you know, where stuff lives, your private, hybrid, multi-cloud, on-premise, as Robert was saying. Um, heterogeneous in terms of the devices, you know, managed, unmanaged, BYOD. 
uh, in terms of your users, you know, it's not just your employees, right? We especially now are, I think we're seeing more and more companies make broader use of kind of gig workers, contractors, consultants, that sort of thing, um, being able to get them access to what they need. And then again, uh, just in terms of the resources, you know, web apps, SaaS apps, servers, services, even APIs, uh, we're seeing people, you know, take advantage of zero trust to cord off uh, which APIs are, are accessible and to whom and under what circumstances. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two, we focus on, uh, you know, the capabilities that companies need, especially when software is at the strategic core of their business or, or if they are software companies. Um, we really uh, pride ourselves on our ability to provide one click access uh, to infrastructure. Uh, we, we find that, uh, as, as Robert was saying, it's complicated. And if you can get that nailed, uh, everything else kind of seems uh, almost almost easy uh, by comparison. Um, we started uh, on the principles of Beyond Corp, Google's original project that we talked about earlier, uh, but we continue to drive those, those principles further. Um, we've really worked hard to make sure that there's an easy, um, a privacy-friendly way of incorporating device trust. In other words, we don't have to have an MDM. If you've got one, great. Uh, we can take signals from your MDM, but you don't have to have one. Um, and we certainly don't need to route your traffic through any centralized choke points or anything else that might be viewed from a privacy perspective as intrusive. Um, and then making sure that we are taking advantage of continuous authorization. Um, we can put a real-time trust score in place so that you always have a, a, a feel for the security posture of those devices that are accessing your resources. And so uh, the key point there, right, being able to have a device, a, a policy that leverages device trust. We, every security product's got policies, no doubt about it. But being able to incorporate device trust in those policies and then do so uh, real time is, is, a, is a neat way to be able to handle some of this stuff. So those are kind of some of the core things that, you know, Banyan Security, you know, feels like are, are, are key to our DNA, who we are and what we're offering. Um, we'd certainly... Uh, love to talk to you uh, about that uh, at your leisure. You can go to our website, www.banyansecurity.io. We'd love to have a deeper conversation with you all. But before we get to that, uh, I promised uh, we'd reserve time for Q&A. We've got a great resource in Robert. Um, so why don't we open up for, for some questions? Yeah, great. We've gotten some questions in, but there's plenty of time for questions, guys. If you do have one, Go ahead and use that question and answer tab and submit it. You can also put it in the chat. And we'll uh, just move it over for you. No big deal at all. Uh, we first question is from Mike, who asks: So, is zero trust a misnomer? You say you need both trusted users and trusted devices. Isn't the assumption of at least advanced per persistent attacks that either users or devices on your net are compromised? I think that is a terrific question. I think zero trust is a buzzword that is unfortunately required to make it to make it known this is a new way of thinking or doing things right uh, but for me it's zero trust network meaning i don't care where the device is they can be at home they can be on my network they can be um you know somewhere else starbucks um <laughs> starbucks yeah but i i <laughs> i don't trust the device uh, I'm sorry, I don't trust the network they're coming from no matter what. I have to build some level of trust in some way, and that's where users and devices come from. The assumption that um, you know a APTs are uh, inf infecting a user and or device, yes, absolutely, that's true. So zero trust does not end with uh, having a user and device level check. You still absolutely need to be doing the security monitoring, the security detections looking at EDR, like adding those to your security program are still important, but you're gonna do that whether you have zero trust or not. Zero trust now gives you some flexibility to, to uh, do things differently. Uh, and then on top of that, if a user's device does get compromised, but there's no VPN connectivity back to the corporate because you're leveraging a zero trust network model, uh, lateral movement, which is critical to these types of attacks is much, much more difficult. It's not impossible, of course, but it's so much more difficult uh, when you don't have that network layer there. So yeah, the, both the least privileged access and, and the prevention of lateral movement, uh, key, absolutely yep. key. Yep. And, and as we've right. seen with other uh, threat vectors, ransomware and other things, you know, really take, you know, almost require that lateral movement to, uh, you know, uh, affect. So being able to shut that down yeah. is super important. Yep. 
Excellent, excellent. Okay, next question here uh, from Sanjeev. Uh, he asks, uh, how does zero trust access prevent supply chain attacks? Ooh, that, <laughs> that is a good question. Um, I think with the most recent types of supply chain attacks um, that were really attacking infrastructure within uh, you know, data, data centers and, and corporations and less about attacking the user side, um, that's going to be a very tricky one. But if you leverage zero trust between servers in the, in the back end, there could be some benefit there potentially. Again, the lateral movement play. Right. Uh, but you can also achieve that and you should be with network segmentation doing that properly. Um, so, yeah, so there may not be a direct correlation. Now, there may be in, in the future state of supply chain attacks mm -hmm. that impact the users more so than infrastructure. Um, and it goes back to the, the answer before in that you, without network level connectivity, it makes things much more difficult to go from one device to another. So they're less effective. All right, great. Uh, we've gotten some great questions in so far, but there's still plenty of time. If you have a question, go ahead and use your question and answer tab and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Next one here is from Brisa who asks, uh, can SSO still be integrated with passwordless authentication taking into account zero trust? Oh, great question. Yeah, uh, John, I mean, John, if you wanna answer that from a Banyan perspective, uh, go for it. But I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, but your, it will be somewhat dependent on your identity stack as well. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one of my it's one of my favorites because it, it, I, I still get a giggle out of you know not you know I have a password manager yes on on my devices, but you know being able to uh, allow employees to have uh, a passwordless path to the resources they need is really nice. I mean, it, let's face it, we've got no shortage of passwords on this planet. Um, and being able to be secure and do so without having to manage passwords um, is really, really nice. It's nice to not have to file IT tickets to do <laughs> password recovery. It's nice on all sides of that equation. All right, great. We actually uh, just got a little chat in I thought I might share. It says, uh, it's from Alexander. He says, zero trust is not only about users, but about suppliers as well. So trust no one, check always. That goes back to that supply chain question. I'd love that comment. What do you guys think? It, it, yeah. It, yeah, and and <laughs> I'd add on that, not only check always, but it, it's not just the initial check, right? The, the, the real kind of groundbreaking idea here is continuously check even after you've checked and, and verified and validated things change. Uh, we live mm -hmm. in a dynamic world. And, and, you know, just because you put somebody on the approved vendor list doesn't necessarily mean that the device they're using at this moment in time is is good. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Thank All you. right. Excellent. Okay, moving along. Uh, next question here. Uh, it's another one from Mike it says, uh, did we used to call zero trust least privilege? And in that zero trust, we always limit what any user or device can do on the network. Yeah, I feel like zero trust is a is an evolution of least privilege. So in some ways, yeah, yes, right. Like it's it's just the least privilege was always about the user, and this is taking mm -hmm. it a neck another level and looking at device. And so so yes, um, it's an evolution of that. The other thing that I would add to that is um, it's not just limiting what a user or device can do on the network, because again, the network is no longer our, our focus. It's about what the user or device, what resource they can access. Yeah. And again, you can even go down to the API level and say, hey, you know, my full time employees who are doing production level work can access, you know, these APIs. And the contracting IT team I hired to do some backend work temporarily can only access these APIs. So it's really less about, it's not about the network and it's about what that user and their device have access to from a resource perspective. All right, all right. So we uh, are about 10 minutes to the top of the hour, which means we have about eight more minutes for question and answer period. So um, once again, there's plenty of time. If you have a question, 
uh, please send it on in. Our next question is from Charles and my buddy Charles. He actually, Charles. Uh, I, I know Charles. Yeah. Chick -fil -A, Charles. yeah. <laughs> Chick fil A's mobile app is the best because of how well it integrates with the store system. Did you need to do extra work to ensure that mobile orders are not a gateway into your POS point of sale yeah. system? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a lot of architecture design uh, security baked in from the beginning when we when we think about uh, the way the mobile order uh, the mobile ordering system works. Uh, so yes, uh, there was some extra work involved there for sure. Okay, all right. We we have another one here that kind of connects zero trust and least privilege access. Where in your zero trust adoption has least privilege access had the biggest impact from a security perspective? Where in the adoption? Um, it's a good question. Just trying to think of, of the best way to, to phrase the answer. Um, yeah, I would say when it comes to cloud infrastructure, right? So mm -hmm. as we started to adopt the usage of AWS, um, one of the things that we did was we tackled it from a, a multi-account uh, strategy perspective. So we have, you know, let's say over 200 accounts, and each one of those accounts has a limited number of people that have access to the infrastructure within that AWS account. And so um, having least privilege there and, um, and then adding in zero trust to that, we, we will get to a very solid point of knowing who and what is connecting to infrastructure at any given point. So yeah, I would say cloud infrastructure for sure. All right, great. So I think we have time for two, maybe three more questions. So please send any last minute stragglers in and uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Next question here for you, Robert. Uh, what is your opinion on trust-based access control versus old school role-based access control? Yeah, I still like old school role-based access control, um, but this is similar to the the uh, least privileged question. It's it's an evolution of it, right? So you still you still need to do role-based in in some ways, but now you can just extend it to this user is in this role and can do these things but only from this device or this type of device. So it's just an extension of that. Um, with a specific trust level, yeah. With Right, with specific trust levels involved, right, yeah. All right, great. Uh, Mike has yet another question. Mike's got some really great right, questions. Mike. Yay, yay, Mike. Okay, how does the zero trust network prevent protocols tunneling on other protocols? I recall articles about getting full internet access through an airport's DNS service by tunnel. How do you prevent exfiltration through non-obvious routes? Uh, so exfiltration is a very different problem. Um, right. I would say uh, zero trust network for me is is all about inbound access and who, who can access to John's point, what resource uh, and what trust level is required to get there. Exfiltration is handled from a very different perspective. Um, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily tie those two together. Um, preventing exfiltration, I mean, in, in traditional sense, that's leveraging proper IPS, proper um, call next gen firewalls that look at applications versus uh, traditional traffic. So it, it would inspect your DNS traffic and say, oh, this isn't real DNS denied, right? But that's not a zero trust network uh, issue. That's a, that's a different pro, uh, problem. All right. All right. Uh, we have one more question here in the queue. Um, but uh, like I said before, there's a few minutes left. So if you do have a question, go ahead and get it on in. Uh, let's see. The question is, how hands-on were you during your solution evaluation? <laughs> <laughs> I have loved this space ever since I read that first Beyond Court paper that I basically have uh, I have been fully hands-on <laughs> and, and sending uh, numerous complaints and or issues and or, um, you know, Hopefully compliments things I too. like, compliments, yeah, compliments <laughs> too, for sure. Um, I, you know, I was get talking, better. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm helping helping people get better. Um, yeah, I was talking about the continuous authorization. Um, that was me playing with that capability and trying to really understand it and getting as hands on as I possibly could. So yeah, extremely hands on. Excellent. All right. All right. Well, we are about five minutes to the top of the hour. That is all the questions that we have currently in our tab. I will go ahead and leave the question and answer tab open to see if we get any last minute stragglers in. And uh, while we are waiting, I do want to quickly remind the audience that today's event is being recorded. And uh, so if you miss any, if you've missed any or all of the webinar, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website. So you can go find it there. You can just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars. Look in the on-demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. All right, no other questions have come in. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the question and answer period. And I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. Some amazing questions today, guys. Thank you so much. I do appreciate your engagement with the, with the question and answer period. And uh, lots, as I said, lots and lots of really great questions that came in. So thank you again. Um, all right. So I think the last thing I have to do today now is to do the drawing for the $425 Amazon gift cards. Let's go ahead and do that. I know it's what everybody's waiting for. All right. Our first winner today is. Uh, Dan B. Congratulations, Dan. Second winner is Brian O. Congratulations, Brian. Our third winner today is Rachel B. Congratulations, Rachel. And our fourth and final winner today is Brent B. Congratulations, Brent. We'll be following up with all four of you via email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. Uh, John and Robert, great presentation. Lots and lots of interesting stuff. I really enjoyed the, your conversation. Uh, and you know, judging from the, the comments and the questions that came in from the audience, I can tell they got a lot out of it too. So thank you very, very much. Really do appreciate it. And thank you, Robert. Thank you, Charlene. Thanks for everyone at uh, MediaOps for putting this together. But Robert, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a super busy guy, and I really do appreciate you uh, walking us through uh, some of your journey so that we can all benefit from that. Yeah, I had a great time. So thanks. And if, if anybody ever wants to talk zero trust or security or just general stuff, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, love to Love to make a connection. All right. All right. And I as well want to thank the audience for joining us today. This, this is Charlene O'Hamlin, and I'm now signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe. Thank you.